Hey, y'all, and welcome back to another episode of Appalachian Intelligence. We're so glad that you guys can join us again, and we're super thankful to have you here. Uh, your hosts, as always, Justin and Ryan. Producer Lance is here with us, as always now, too. I, I don't know why I keep saying me and Ryan as always and not Lance. Lance is a part of this thing as much as we are now. He's trying um, to me, Ryan. Yeah, I noticed. He does that every time, too. That's... I've tried to leave him out for years. I can't get rid of him. Can't get rid of him. <laughs> no, we're super glad to have you guys back. Um, we're really, really thankful for the love that we're receiving on this last episode. Uh, it's shattering personal records. So for that, we appreciate you guys. Keep showing the love. Keep spreading the word. Uh, keep spreading the show. That's the way this show grows. Um, we're going to be talking about a topic today that I think is really, really interesting. And really unheard of, uh, it, it's something that, you know, I'd heard a couple places but never had really dove into before. Um, and it, it's crazy. We're going to be talking about probably or maybe one of the worst occupations in all of human history. Let's see Micro do this one. <laughs> And that would be the occupation of a sin eater, S-I-N eater, literally a person who comes in after somebody is deceased and eats a ritual meal to take away their sins. So this is talking as, as Appalachia as it gets. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's definitely this is if you want an Appalachian episode, if you want to talk about Appalachia culture tradition this is the episode this is going to be really really close to our granny witch episode because there's a whole lot of parallels with it it ties in and, and weaves in and out together with the whole process of, of sin eating but the crazy thing about this this topic is you know every week we we don't really like we don't have a back catalog of episodes that we're, we pretty much record. We're turning and burning. I mean, we're recording sometime throughout the week and it's dropping that Sunday at midnight. So I mean, that's the reason we don't have a Patreon going yet is because we can't get the time to sit down and start putting out bonus content. We're, we're all crazy busy, but the, the nut so thing about this whole topic and just show you, this is how stuff's been going with this podcast from the get go. I threw out to the guys the other day. I said, hey, what do y'all want to talk about this week? You know, because, of course, we talk about a lot of different topics, but we need to kind of focus on one so we can at least get semi-prepared for it as a whole, collectively. So I put it out there, and, and the crazy thing is I was talking to Ryan at work that day. I think this was like, what, guys, Monday? Yes, Monday or Tuesday. Yeah. I was talking to Ryan at work that day and I was throwing some different topic ideas out there. And I said, Ryan, have you ever heard of sin eating? Have you ever heard of sin eaters? And he was like, no, nah, no, I don't think so. You know what? It, so I was explaining it a little bit to him, you know, what sin eaters were, uh, how they operated. And later on Lance messaged and he was like, uh, you want to talk about sin eaters? And I promise you, promise, we have never, ever, ever had a conversation about sin eaters. I don't think that I've spoken the word sin eaters out loud in my entire life. And then it just so happened that day, the one thing that me and Ryan had talked about that Lance wasn't around for, Lance is like, oh, yeah, hey, y'all want to talk about this? <laughs> it's just, it's crazy, dude. It's crazy. So unless Lance is really like a, a CIA mole that has been planted here in this show, which is possible. It's possible. If everyone He's got remembers, bugs. he was missing for a little bit. Yeah, that's true. That's true. He was kidnapped for a while. So anyway, we're jumping in here. We're talking about sin eaters. Um, Lance, you want to start us off with it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sin Eaters was the first, I first heard of Sin Eaters. I was probably, I don't 
know, middle school, maybe early high school age. And it was simply because my mother was reading a book um, by one Francine Rivers, who was a pretty famous, somewhat famous, I guess probably a B-list type author um, that was writing a book called The Last of the Sin Eaters. And I'd never heard of that before. Neither she hadn't either. Um, and this couple of weeks ago, we were on vacation. And like none of my family members, with the exception of my wife, had any idea that we were on a podcast. <laughs> so we're sitting around down there uh, in the condo late up one night, and we're just kind of talking about stuff and just kind of mentioned, it's like, hey, you guys know I've been podcasting with Justin. And we're, I was like, what? So I go through the whole thing and kind of talk about all this different stuff. They're super interested in it, and I think they're listening to it now. But my mom nice. offhandedly says, hello, have y'all had a, done an episode on Sin Eaters yet? And I was like, no, uh, but we need to. And it, all those memories come flooding back in of her reading that story uh, many, many years ago. Um, and I remember doing some research on sin eating and kind of having an idea what that was. But so uh, to get into what a sin eater is, um, again, super Appalachia um, ritual that kind of took place. Um, think of interesting, weird things that take place in Appalachia. Uh, snake handling churches, right, will be one of those things that, that takes place around here. Um, some of the granny witch and stuff we talked about a couple of months ago. Uh, and then this sin eating kind of falls along the same line. Now, I don't know that that goes on anymore uh, as frequently as it once did. Um, but it is definitely something that was here late 1800s, early 1900s through the Great Depression. Um, and essentially what the sin eater was or is uh, would have been an outcast of the community. Um, the town drunk, um, the thief, the whatever um, that was kind of scarlet lettered. And he or she would come in uh, in a dark cloak after the passing of a loved one. Um, and they would take an in true Appalachian form, you know, even now when a family member passes away, one thing we all do, we want have, taking some food, right? Taking some comfort food. Um, Absolutely. Churches do that. People do that. Families do that now. It's one of the things, just kind of a cultural thing that we do. We cook up some fried chicken or soup bean, cornbread, red occasion, make desserts, and we take them to the family just as a way to show love and appreciation and sympathy. Um, same thing was going on here. They would fix this big meal. Uh, and they would actually place the meal on the corpse. Now, there's sometimes they would leave it on the clothes casket. Sometimes they would actually put it on the actual corpse itself, kind of just depended. Um, and then the sin eater would come in, uh, usually recited some ritual lines, whispered lines, um, eat the meal, and that would therefore, in thought in theory, uh, absolve the deceased of all of their worldly sins, so allowing them to passage into heaven. Uh, rather than being kind of damned here to wander on the earth. Now, um, this death ritual is, there's a ton of these, right? Um, undertakers and morticians even today have certain rituals. If in our area as well, uh, kind of when the same time as sin eating was going on, people would hire professional mourners uh, to come in to wail and lament uh, the passing of family members. Some people would actually... Uh, hire people to come in and sit with the dead. That was a, that's another very Appalachian thing. Family members or somebody just kind of, kind of come in and sit. You know, it's the rituals, not the rituals, but the, uh, the way in which funerals are kind of taking place now is changing, especially since COVID. Uh, now a lot of people just kind of have a one-day thing, right? You come in, you have the service and the viewing, and then they go straight to the, the, the cemetery. Uh, but for the most part, especially, again, speaking from experience here in Appalachia, a, a funeral, a passing of a loved one is, is a two-day affair. Right? You have a de an evening, you're, uh, they come in and the family can come in, or members, friends of the family can kind of come in and show their concern, and there's usually a, a service that night. Um, and then the next day, during the late morning afternoon, um, is kind of when you go to the cemetery and, and, and pass uh, and, and bury a loved one. Um, well, it was common that they would hire somebody to come in and sit with the bodies and sit there all night. Um, reasons or variety of those reasons. Um, actually know some older people that did some death watching, they called it. 
And there's a guy, an older guy in our church that did some death watching. Um, and he tells the story today of him sitting in with a, a body of some a family that he knew, but didn't know real, real. He was young. He was, you know, in his um, early teens or late middle teens, I think. Um, and was sitting with the body and rigor mortis set up. Body sets her up right in the middle of the night. So it's absolutely scared him to death. And of, of course, obviously it would. Um, but that's, that's another one of those rituals, people just kind of sitting there with, with, with those bodies. Same kind of concept here with these sin eaters. Now, the sin eaters were paid for their services. It usually wasn't very much money. Um, they you know, believe where they were then, once they had consumed a meal, they were in turn then carrying the sins that they ate along with them. Um, so the sum that they were paid um, made them unclean and evil in the eyes of the neighbors who then, of course, would shun them because they've eaten all the sins of that family, right? So the questions uh, have been put forth um, of who eats the sin eater's sin, right? And that's, there's a, that's, that's another topic for another evening. Um, but it was kind of commonly believed that uh, voluntarily taking the sins upon others, uh, the sin eater was just damned to go to hell because he had consumed, he or she had consumed so many of these sins. Um, now, tracing its origin, uh, like all the way back to Egypt and Greece, uh, there, there, there are practices in those ancient cultures of sin eating also. Um, we also see sin eating kind of getting its roots in the Catholic rite of absolution, uh, which of course, it's not an Appalachian podcast, we don't talk about the Catholic Church, right? Um, Appalachian no. Theologians podcast, you know, us getting into some kind of argument about the Catholic Church. Um, but uh, the right of that pollution, of course, is the forgiveness of sins by a priest at or near time of death. Um, so in order for those who maybe died unexpectedly to be absolved, sin eaters became common in Wales and in Ireland. Huh, interesting. Uh, in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, of course, immigrants, like Snake said a couple of weeks ago, brought that over on a boat with them. Um, that's how that kind of got um, to the area uh, that we live in now. Um, now, there, there's different rituals, like any other different little communities would have different rituals that took place. Uh, but the senator usually was ostracized, lived in a remote area away from themselves. Um, the practice is pretty taboo, um, and few accounts of sin eating has actually survived. Um, but sin eating kind of, again, in Appalachia, seemed to be an anonymous um, or you know, ostracized member of the family. Uh, some Appalachian cultures are in, I guess, communities. Uh, the identity of that person was actually kept secret. Um, and he would live normally, live in a regular community, but nobody knew that he was a sin eater. So you've got some Appalachian regions that kind of kept this individual off to themselves, some Appalachian regions that people just didn't know. Um, he would just kind of come in and, and be the sin eater. And he would be summoned upon death by you know, of a loved one. He'd come in into the home, family would prepare the meal. They would actually place it on the chest of the corpse. Um, and the food was eaten. And one of the ritual sayings was, would be something to the, when, and I had trouble finding some of these ritual sayings, but um, I give easement now to thee and for, they, and for their earthly sins, uh, dear man or woman, upon my own soul. Uh, for your repentance. Um, he would come in, he would do that, he would leave and not say a word. Um, only to appear again, obviously, when he was, when he was summoned. Now, this died out um, in the 20th century, right at the turn of it. There's a handful of accounts that it continued in the 1930s. Um, and I know of some, some old timers that knew of that taking place, kind of remembering that from their childhood of that coming um, taking place. Uh, now, there's still tales of sin eating that persist in North Carolina, West Virginia, East Tennessee, and Virginia, right here in, in good old Appalachia. Um, and they claims that it may have happened up to the 1950s, uh, but those aren't any alleged accounts. That's just kind of hearsay, um, word of mouth kind of thing, so no validation to it. Uh, Francine Rivers' book, again, talks about it. It's a Christian history fiction book. I mean, if you have a chance to read it, um, it's it's interesting. It's a very interesting take, uh, not a take, but very interesting. Um, I would think very close to historically accurate on kind of what the sin eater was. Uh, the last sin eater 
and was actually adapted into the film in 2007. Now, not the I've actually watched it. It's not the greatest movie ever, <laughs> um, but it does kind of give the story of second generation Welsh immigrants living in the Appalachian Mountains and their family that have the Sinir in it. Um, and for some reason, I think Heath Ledger's in it. I don't quite remember off the top of my head. Um, Sounds about right. Yeah, uh, but it's um, an interesting thing that has taken place in Appalachia. It is like it, it, it is it is it is as Appalachian as Snake Handling and Granny Witch and Faith Healing and all this kind of stuff we talked about. But it's a really interesting thing that was probably there's probably not much talked about now because it has been a while since it's taken place. But you can find some old timers that have been around. Uh, they probably definitely knew of uh, this taking place. Well, again, folks, that's the show. Glad you guys could join us. Uh, no, I'm just playing. Lance always does a great job uh, laying the whole thing out and giving y'all all the footnotes before we completely sidebar and get into talking about something totally off topic. But for a minute, we're going to keep it on this. Um, talking about, you know, the Sin Eaters and how it relates to, you know, how it's just, it's Appalachia to the core. You know, it's old school Appalachia through and through. And, you know, you're talking about it being, you know, originating in Ireland and Wales and Britain, you know, the places that our, that our ancestors come from, that they came across with these, these traditions and these beliefs and all of these different things. Um, I, was, I was explaining a little bit of this to a coworker today. And they were talking, they said, you know, it seems to me, and this was their exact words, it seems to me that here in Appalachia, in the early settlement of Appalachia, there was a, there was a great combination and mixture of Protestant Christianity and paganism. <laughs> I was like, well, I mean, yeah, if you can look at it like that, because you have all of these rituals you have all take the sin eater for instance okay yes it's coming from a let, let's say an intent of christianity they're trying to you know an unexpected death this person hasn't had the chance to confess you know potential sin or whatever before they pass so you have this person coming in to take those sins, dissolve those sins from that, absolve those sins from that person. But the way that the way this is all playing out with this ritual, with these, this saying of, you know, I'll pawn my soul for this act that I'm doing. You know, it's all, it's, it's just, it's so crazy, man. It's hard to wrap your head around. Like, like I couldn't imagine the church today, or not the church as a whole, just I'll, I'll say my specific church. I can't imagine somebody passing and them saying, oh, let, let's bring a sin eater in here. And like, you know, heads would explode. And I know that a lot of these things, that's just, that's what it is. It's based on tradition and it's based on all these different things. But where is that line like, where's that line to where it gets, okay, this is, this is crazy ritualistic. You know, we're, we're pretty much, you know, just saying spells over a dead body. <laughs> and I, I don't know, dude. It's just, it's crazy for me to think about and wrap my brain around just this act, just me personally. When you were saying they pawn their soul, how could the same sin eater go body after body and take away sins that they've already put you only get one soul yeah i don't know man but the concept behind it i think is they're trying to like in christianity and i'm not going to get churchy on this but just kind of like load the basis on it in christianity christ died for all sin right that's that's kind of the premise of everything the ritual of sin eating is that one person was able to come in and take all of those, every person, you know, Christ one death was able to save people who accept him, right? The sin eater comes in, 
and can take all of those sins because that's that one person doing that. They're trying to bridge that gap, right? That, that, that's kind of what, why the one person was able to come in and do that. Now, totally opposite, you know, a lot of times of what, what actually kind of happens, right? But that, that was, that's a good question. I think that's a good question. I think a question a lot of people would have, like, how could one person eat the sins of so many people? It should be one person and one sin, right? That, it, we kind of think of things that same way, but keeping with the ritualistic ideas of how these people were living and how our ancestors lived, right? Very faith-based um, with a lot of <laughs> not so faith-based kind of things going on, but thought that it was, but it, that's, I think the answer to that question, Ryan, is they thought that one person could come in and take care of those sins, kind of like Christ took care of sins. That's, I think, I think that's the connection there. Well, apparently they didn't make that connection if, they uh shunned these people <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. like would you do this to jesus like <laughs> no i completely agree that, that was kind of one of the things i thought too that's why i think some of these communities probably didn't shun them they just kind of allowed that senior to be anonymous like you know, we wouldn't know that which again i thought was kind of crazy because these communities aren't made up of hundreds of thousands of people right it's, it's a couple families it all knew yeah. each other. So when one family member dies, and the senior comes in, like, then you know who he's, there's not, not too many people that didn't know who he yeah. was. Who <laughs> wasn't <laughs> here? Yeah. There's yeah. eight of us. Yeah, it's almost like everybody knew, but nobody, but nobody, nobody said anything about it. He is completely like, 100% Appalachia. Like, don't look at Lance. Don't look at Lance in the eye. Don't, don't, he'll get all of his sin. Don't, he's got so, he's so full of sin. He's ain't everybody's. We've had four deaths this month. He's took all that. I knew, Don't look at it. I knew he was putting on some weight, but I thought, you know. <laughs> it's all that corn. Those sins in, my goodness. It's all that cornbread and bush light. <laughs> well, that's the thing. That's what the majority of these meals consisted of. It was just, especially back when you trace the origin. Well, the origin, you know, Lance, as Lance mentioned, was Egypt and Greece. Um, but it was really, really common and really popular like he said, in Ireland and Wales and Britain and, uh, you know, these places in Europe. And there, you know, obviously they didn't have, there wasn't a whole lot of families that could just lay out five course meals. It was usually bread and wine or beer, mead, you know, something of, of that sort that they passed over and, and the, the sin went into that food and the sin eater would uh, consume that food and take on the sin. Which also has very... Religious, re religious connotations on it as well. Exactly. It's just like partaking, you're a representative of partaking in communion, you know, the, the, the blood and the flesh. It's basically sacrament. It's yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's what it is. It's, 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 it's a representation of it's symbolism of all that, but that's still, that's the part that it's just, which, you know, it, it's so hard to sit here and think and, and read all these just these old wives tales and all the things that that the old folks did in this area, you know, in, in Appalachia. And, you know, we were talking about how it intertwined with all the the granny witchcraft and, and all of this different stuff. And, you know, we, of course, we did an entire episode on that one. So if you guys haven't listened to that one and you don't know what we're talking about go check out uh, Witch Granny's Witch on Appalachian Intelligence. Go check that one out. It'll give you a little baseline of, of where we're coming from there. Um, but the way that it just kind of intermingles and weaves in and out of that, again, you have this tradition steeped in, in ritual and superstition that was performed in a whole lot of communities every day you know here in Appalachia and from what I read um you know kind of the the people being outcasts and outskirts that did happen mostly in Europe as far as I could tell once it made its way across the pond and came into Appalachia it was more like Lance was explaining how these people were volunteers in the community they were just you know totally kept secret they came in hoods and cloaks after dark you know all this different stuff. Didn't tell their family they were walking out the door. Night, guys. I got to go, you know, talk to a man about a dog. 
and then they just go in and they right. perform this over my head and <laughs> yeah I'll walk out you're looking like a jedi Dad, why do you have the what is, why do you have that black cloak for yeah what's that lightsaber on your hip for <laughs> sorry i've been watching obi-wan but no man it's just it's crazy to me that like there's so many there's so many traditions and and superstitions in this area and this is just one of those that this is one of the most mind-boggling for me personally because it's just the thought of like we keep saying these these really faith-based people you know these people that were that were in the word they were reading their bibles and i mean yeah you can make these comparisons and you can say and it's just it's it's the fear of it's the love of family and friends and loved ones and the fear of where they're going to spend eternity that brings all this about like i get all that but for the sin eater if the sin eater believes what they are doing and they know there's there's one of two things here Number one, they're super, 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 super poor, and they have got to find a way to get the next meal, okay? Or number two, they don't believe in nothing, and they're just going in and eating cornbread and drinking bush light a couple times a week or a month or whatever just to get a, a quick little full belly, and then they're going on about their business. They're just saying some words, waving some food over a dead body, and that's that we're going on or three this person's got to be like jacked up like really <laughs> jacked up it and just doesn't I, care well i mean that in like a twisted kind of way you know because for me personally i couldn't imagine going in especially because these guys these, these people are getting paid okay now yeah they're in the same community everybody knows everybody but it's not like they were, you know, like Lance said, most of the time these were outcasts. They didn't love anybody. Nobody loved them. I actually read a whole lot of articles that it was said that if you looked in, that's why I said about looking into Lance's eyes. If you looked into the eyes of these people, then you would be cursed. Then those sins would rub off on you. Like these people were that looked down upon. They were that, that, that big of an outcast. So, like these people, it was one, they're super poor and broke. They need to eat. They don't believe in anything or they're twisted. Got to be. Got to be. I would say they just don't believe in any of that. And they're like, yeah, I'll eat. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I couldn't imagine going in and eating a meal off of a dead body, especially somebody that I, that was an acquaintance or I barely knew or I didn't know. It's just, I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah, I wouldn't want to eat it off of a body. Well, and that brings up, all right, we got to jump into it. That only took 20 minutes. This, this, isn't, this isn't Appalachian intelligence if we don't get into the super weird. Okay, we can't just talk historical reference and reverence. Okay. Okay, so you have people going in here. All right. I've already laid out the option that some of these people could be twisted. Okay. And, and by twisted, I mean, just maybe, you know, okay, you'll see where I'm going. You have people coming in performing these rituals with the dead. All right. And how many of these cases or instances do you think that maybe more was being done. Like maybe they weren't just trying to come in and we could go super, super dark here, like super dark, but just keeping along the lines of paranormal supernatural. What if these sin eaters are coming in, not just collecting sins, but trying to collect something more or trying to obtain something more? I mean, I think if you're coming in with a ritual saying, I'll pawn my soul, that's a big blank check. I mean, what other entities 
could be out there and listening to this and being like, okay, all right. You want to pawn your soul? What are you willing to do for it? I mean, that's just my thought. Like, I think any time, like, yeah, I've, I've prayed to God, to, to Jesus in my faith and kind of, you know, gave that blank check prayer that, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm willing, I'm a, I'm a willing vessel. You use me however you want to use me. Okay. But in that turn, when I'm praying to my God, maybe some of these people were praying to other gods. When you're coming in and you're using this, if you could use this as a front, say, and you're coming in here, we know all throughout the history of the occult and witchcraft and all of these, all the way back to the Bible. It talks about necromancy. I mean, that's part of sorcery is necromancers. So going down that angle, that point, what are y'all, what are y'all's thoughts on that? I think every culture has such a fascination with death and what comes after that I think almost to an extent that it would have to be like this ritual with this sinny to ritual. Like it would almost have to be a form right of, of us as humans trying to extend the life of loved ones around us because of we weren't they weren't good enough or didn't do enough here on earth. And I think any time that we try to uh, manipulate um, what happens after death, because we have that great fear of the unknown, and it's just us trying to, I don't know, control things that we can't control, which is the same thing as necromancers and same thing as the occult and same thing of all these different ritual things that we do as a, as a human species to explain the things that we're scared of one, two, we can't explain and three, the unknown. Um, so I think, yeah, you, man, it, probably not every senator was coming in and setting up a pentagram and laying out his book of Satan, trying to get rid of the evil spirits like we saw last week. But I mean, I, there's, I, you, you know, good and well that at least one of them or four of them or 10 of them or whatever, maybe there was a senator society that they would meet up at the local, I don't know, not, not, not the local bar at the time, but the local whatever it was, the saloon or whatever they had. The, the tavern. Tavern, I guess. Um, and, the and, mead hall. And traded these stories and maybe had something they were doing. It. There was a reason that this lasted for a while, and the reason, you can go, it, this traces all the way back to the medieval times. Like, this is not something that was, like, just popped up there in Ireland for a couple hundred years and made its way over. Like, there's, uh, this is, a long history of different forms of sin eating that are in a huge amount of cultures um, trying to control what happens when you die. Right? And that, that's. And there's no loopholes to death. It's, exactly. You're just right, but this is what this is, though. This is them trying to create one, right? It's exactly. The, it's the fear of the unknown. Exactly. Nobody, you don't, nobody knows 100% what happens, what you experience, you know, except for the people who have experienced it. So, and we don't know what they know, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's it. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, in, in every, any, any time you try to do something or try to have a, 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 a I don't know if pathway is probably not a good word, but Try to have a way in which you can help with the afterlife. You're trying to control something that you know that you can't control. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. I don't know. To me, it just seems like there's a whole lot of room there for really sideways things to be going on. Absolutely. And, they're probably and that's, worse. oh, yeah, I'm, su I'm sure that there were, you know, like, like we said, you you know anybody that's that's willing to do this or it's like just voluntarily? Because some people were, like Lance said, they were thieves. They were, you know, the town drunk. They were people getting into trouble. 
that were kind of sentenced to these this role. But there was also volunteers. So that's the ones that I'm, you know, I'm not looking so much at the horse thief that was like, you stole too many horses, you're a sin eater from now on. You're just dealing with it. We're sick of it. We don't want to kill you because we're a good Christian community. We're but sick you're... of your shit, Steve. <laughs> that's it. We're not going to kill you. But we're going to let you burn in hell now. <laughs> I so, do. I do like the thought of a of, of a secret sin eater society where they have meetings. <laughs> like, oh my God, David, have you had rape yet? <laughs> no, but I just had sodomy and it was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! I mean. That would be awesome. I'd want to sneak into one of those meetings. <laughs> well, there is a Sin Eaters Guild, but it's totally not associated with what you're talking about right now. <laughs> it's actually um, like a veteran founded and controlled organization <laughs> that that's what they're saying is they, they take on the darkness so they can be the darkness when they have to be so everybody else can see the light and have freedom. It's actually a pretty cool concept when you, they just kind of twisted it around a little bit, but it's pretty cool. They got merch and stuff. I was checking it out earlier. I might buy a shirt. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Sweet. They use the help veterans. I wish they didn't use a tarot card for their uh, logo. <laughs> like that would be, I don't love that part of it, but you know, hey, whatever. They use the hangman. They use the hangman's tarot card. He's hanging upside down, but he's got his heart in his hand. It's a good play. It's a good play on it, though. It is a good play. It's a good play. Like everything they've done, they've kind of twisted to fit their own uh, vision, their own mission. But it's really cool. I mean, it, it is awesome. They're actually trying to help people. They're trying to help veterans and, and people that are in crisis. So good for them. Look them up. Buy buy some merch. Donate. <laughs> really cool. It's a really cool thing. They have really cool shirts. They do have really awesome looking merch. No joke. We might buy a couple and wear on the next episode on here. <laughs> but I'll you to that now. I say like I'm going to buy them. I say we. But you know, it's you look at one of these, or you look at the act of sin eating, and yeah, it's a little more out there than the usual, you know, after death practices. But still, you know, there's a lot of, you know, like you said, practices and tradition in Appalachia that's went on for decades, well, centuries, like you were talking about, staying up all night with the dead, you know, the death watchers. Um, you know, still today, a lot of families will have their family reunions in cemeteries. They'll have them right in the middle of the cemetery. So all their past loved ones can, can be there with them. Uh, something that my family still does today, we always, if a family member dies, the men in the family dig the grave. We always dig the grave, and we always fill it back in. Always. Doesn't matter. So, you know, that's just some of those things that have really kind of died out and went away just with the, uh, the modern you know progression of us as a, a culture and a species but you know there's still some of those things that in this area in Appalachia in general and I'm sure well I'm sure there's probably some hollers out there right now that seeing eating is still going on I wouldn't doubt that a bit but there's still some of these things that that we hold on to as a culture and for me personally you know in my family the reason we do that part of it is just like you were, well, not just like, it's not like we're trying to manipulate the afterlife. It's just like, it's that last ditch effort. Oh, this is the last thing that I can do for this person. You know, yeah, they're dead and gone. They're not here. They, they don't know it, but the last thing that we can do for them is to dig this grave, put in the work, put in the sweat. And while you're doing it, you're sharing stories, you're laughing, you're crying, you're, you're spending that time together and coming together in something productive 
to celebrate that life. And you know you're doing a good job doing it. You know you're doing it exactly the way that you want it done. It's just – it's a really good feeling for, for us. You know, we've – like I said, we've always done it. And as long as I'm alive, we'll keep that tradition going, even if I'm the only one doing it. So I might have to rec recruit you boys one day because this – Man, I didn't even know this guy. <laughs> Look, I'm not asking you to come in and eat the sins, okay, Ryan? I could do that. And believe me, there's a lot of sin in my family, brother. A lot of sin. We're outlaws. Hungry. You better bring an empty belly. There's always room for snacks. That's We're having mac and cheese and Kool-Aid. Oh, man. But, no, it's just – that's some of the traditions that – um but, you know, man, still, Appalachian superstition in general, it's just so – it's so crazy. Like, especially around death. Like, think about all of the things that you guys have heard throughout your lives. Like, all the little superstitions that your family, your moms, your grandmas, your, you know, your whoever have said, oh, well, if you dream about somebody giving birth, I mean, somebody's going to die. I've heard yeah. that mine. I've heard that my entire life. A uh, death in a dream is a birth in real life. Yep. Deaths come in threes. Deaths come in threes, and that one I believe. Like you've been <laughs> almost. It is you, weird. You, you, it yeah, is weird. You can almost like make those connections. Yeah. Yes. And usually the weird thing is, is those threes are all correlated somehow. It's either like the same family or they have the same issues, or they're the same age range. Same There's town. always, yeah, like, I, I believe that one for sure. Oh, crud. But here's one I found earlier. Or I found a couple of these earlier just because I was interested. And a lot of these I've heard before, but I would have never just off the top of my head thought of them. But here's a few superstitions that I found in this article that people talk about that relate to death in Appalachia. If a bird flies in the house, that means someone will die. Um, mirrors must be covered after a death in the house or whoever looks into one and sees their reflection directly after will die. Which that one's a... These old folks... They ain't as dumb as, like, some of these superstitions, yeah, but they're not as dumb. I mean, there's a whole troop, uh, there's a whole genre of the paranormal out there right now that totally focuses and concentrates on mirrors and how they're gateways and portals, and that, that one's pretty good. Um, when someone dies, all the clocks in the home must be stopped to prevent another death. I'd never heard that one. No. Uh, you must tell the bees if there is a death in the family or they'll swarm. I haven't heard that one either. Never rock an empty rocking chair because it signifies death. I have heard that one. But here is one of the, well, it's one of the craziest ones for me just because y'all know where I operate. But I've never heard this one. If you hear a screech owl at dusk, someone will soon die. Hmm. Now, these old folks ain't as stupid as what a lot of people think. I mean, y'all, y'all know my thoughts on the screech owl and uh, a lot of the symbolism that goes along there. Yeah. Well, a lot of that is just hooey. And well, yeah, obviously. If you have an open window, you know, sometimes birds will fly in. It doesn't mean anybody's going to die. What if the bird hits the person really, really hard in the head? I guess. But it wasn't. It was because the bird flew in the window, but it's not going to happen every time, is what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, good gravy. 
Uh, we did use uh, uh, right at the girls' bedroom. There was this cardinal that built a nest, and this thing would see its reflection every morning when the sun would come up just perfect. It could catch its reflection, and it would beat on the girls' window, waking them up around six six thirty every morning. So <laughs> that was awesome. Dang, that I, is I tried, crazy. I tried so many times to get rid of that bird. My oh, wife does <clears throat> me too. Something with cardinals and past loved ones. Remember what it is right off the top of my head. There's something that goes in hard. That sounds familiar. She's passed out sleeping. So yeah, there's there, we've got a couple that that are here that are like, you know, these cardinals are bright red, but these are like like they pop out when you see them. And she yeah. always says something that she says. Can't remember what I'll ask her. I'll bring that up next time. Okay. Well, I've heard that when a cardinal comes to visit, that's a loved one coming to check in. Maybe, and maybe that's kind of what she. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. And here's another. I'm not going to say. Here's another coincidence. That's Lance's favorite word. You know, we're doing this episode. We're talking about Appalachia. We're talking about tradition. We're talking about granny witches. We just got a comment on our granny witch episode on YouTube. This is from Jody Goodman, and it says, My mom all dug roots and used plants to make medicine, but there ain't no way I would have ever called her a witch. <laughs> I feel you, Jody. I feel you. She was a devoted missionary Baptist. Love y'all's podcast slash YouTube channel. I'm from Western Kentucky, but part of my family came from Harlan, Kentucky. And to be honest, I guess the old mountain medicine works uh, I guess the old mountain medicine work never was sick much. Side thought, never went to the doctor much as a kid. When I got a cut, she'd have me soak the cut in coal oil, as she called it. Kerosene is what I think it was. Anyway, I enjoy the broadcast. That's a good one. I've never, I have, this is a long time since I've heard kerosene referred to as coal oil. Uh, yeah, me too. Another really good one. I remember, I remember hearing that when I was younger. Um, that's that's a good one. I'm, I'm going to start referring to kerosene as coal oil from now on. That's the only thing I can call kerosene. My papa used to call it coal oil, and I'd totally forgotten about that. You know, he passed away when I was 10, 11 years old, something like that. Appreciate I totally bringing that back up. That, that, that'll, that'll stick in my head now. That's a good one. Yeah, thanks for that, Jody. Thanks for that. It couldn't You couldn't have picked a better time for it, brother, while we're, uh, while we're talking about it. Yeah. You know, just another one of those. Crazy coincidences. <clears throat> but no, I just think, man, it's, yeah, you know, we talk, of course, this, this podcast, it's Appalachian intelligence. We're Appalachian boys. You know, we, our roots run deep. We've got a lot, there's, there's so much history, man. There's so much history. And it's a place that has been stereotyped in such a way that, it's almost heartbreaking, really, when you when you see – not that I care personally what any outsider thinks of this area or thinks of me and my accent or what – you know, I don't care about any of that. What upsets me is when they look at these – when they look at the old folks, when they look at our mamas and papas and great-grandmas and great-grandpas, when they look at the people that settled this place that was probably never even supposed to have been settled and they dug their roots in here and they refused to quit and they refused to give up. They kept treading on, kept treading along and they did come up with all these traditions and superstitions and, and had these, this Appalachian folk, folk magic or, you know, the granny witchery or whatever you want to call it, you know, just using herbs and all this different stuff. There weren't doctors around. There weren't grocery stores. There weren't, they literally, they grew and hunted what they ate. They built their own homes. They made their own clothes. They worked their own fields. They performed their own medicine. They found their own antibiotics. They found their own fever reducers. They done all this stuff right here and survived. Not only survived, but a lot of times thrived. You've got some huge super wealthy families that have came out of this area and done amazing things in the world and i don't care what anybody says 
the knowledge and the intellect. You know what? My great grandma, she couldn't read or write a lick. She couldn't spell her own name. Couldn't spell her own name. Her name was Zora. Everybody called her, called her Zori, of course, you know, because the, the A, E, N's and Y. She couldn't write a Z. But just like I told you all that story about my uncle having the seizures, she goes into the woods for a little while, comes back an hour or two later. He don't have seizures anymore. Just with an armful of, of herbs and shrubs and, and whatever else she picks out of the woods. So for the knowledge that that takes to not only withstand, but to power through, man, you have to, like, I don't care what you think, but you have to respect these people. You have to respect this culture. And as crazy as we think the old folks are, man, you got to love them. You got to love and respect how freaking tough they were. Exactly right. That's the re one of the one of the main reasons, and I I kind of mentioned this before, but it's one of the main reasons why I decided to start a family here and stay here. Um, is just because the nature with which people are raised and just the grit. <laughs> all right, I mean, just, there's just people talk about Pittsburgh grit and Rust Belt grit and all that kind of stuff, but like people in Appalachia just have a different type of grit um, that allows them to get through a whole bunch of different terrible scenarios, right? And we do get such a bad rap sometimes because of, you know, with the opioid problem that's been going on for the last 30 years and the kind of the poor nature of the area and the way we sound like we're not very intelligent because we run everything in in ER and we, we, we twang, our eye, twang our eyes and, and bring in our ease. They don't exactly like we're supposed to sound and, we get such a bad rap for, but I've been a lot of places and met a lot of people um, over my 33 years. And from up in the north to out west to the Midwest to other couple of the countries as well, like nobody just gets it like people in Appalachia get it. Like, we just get it. It's just, and, and again, we're, we're all three proud to be here and we think it's the greatest place ever. And but like, just, but people just get it. Like, it's just, it's just, I don't know how else to describe it. They they just get locked. And they just get it and know how to kind of live and have their own. Everybody's very common in, in, in their mind as far as how they go day to day, but yet in other ways so individual in which the way they're raising their families and going through the things they're going through as families. But you look at it from a cultural standpoint, it's, it's all very much similar because that's what Appalachia is. And I think that's why it's so important for us to, Every chance I get, right? Every chance I get, I, I will speak the praises of our region, of our area, of our people. Um, my grandparents moved down. My, my uh, grandmother was from Pennsylvania. My grandfather was from Columbus, Ohio. Um, just a city boy, straight up city boy that moved down here to, to start a church and be a missionary and, and, and pastor and stuff because he just loved the area and loved the people because it was just... Appalachian people are just built different. Yeah. Gosh, you're about to pump me up. I'm about to write a song right now. <laughs> Appalachia. Heck yeah. <laughs> oh, you beat me. <laughs> is it? Yeah. <laughs> no, man, it is. Like, it's just, there's, I don't know. It. Like, a lot of times, you know, I feel like I've lost so much from or not lost so much, but I've, I've never took hold of and, and put into place the things that my dad did. And he probably feels the same way with the things that, you know, his dad did, you know, and so on and so forth. Like I grew up every single summer, you know, spring and summer up in the fall, helping my mama in the garden, you know, three and four times a week we were in the garden. And then when it was time to, yeah, get was, that fruit out. <laughs> that's it. That's it. When it was time to to pick and bring in the harvest, you know, I spent a lot of evenings stringing beans and breaking beans and drying beans, you know, doing a lot of these different, you know, shucking corn. 
I spent a whole lot of time doing all this stuff. And when I was younger, I hated it. I hated it. Like it just, I, there, I would have rather been doing anything else in the world. But now that I'm older, you know, I always said, I'm, I'm never going to go. I'm never going to be back in a garden unless I absolutely have to. Well, I think it's about time, number one, for us to absolutely have to be. <laughs> We're pretty close to it. But, you know, there's a lot of those traditions, and or not traditions, but there's a lot of those things, those lifestyles that was going on when I was younger. As I'm getting older, I'm like, you know what? We really need to get back to that. Like, I really need to have a garden. I really need, you know, just like my 14-year-old daughter the other day, she wanted to learn how to can. Well, I didn't have a garden, so we went to a uh, farmer's market, bought a bushel of green beans, and she spent an entire day learning how to can and canning 27 quarts of green beans the other day. Now, for me, look, me personally, you know, She's she's great in school, and I'm super impressed by that. I love that. She's super athletic. I love that. You know, she's strong in her faith. I love that. But this is one of those things that I, of course, I don't put it up there with, you know, but that's one of those teaching, learning moments, lessons in life that she's going to have from here on out. I mean, that's that's huge. So those are still those things that are that are going on around here. There's probably not a lot of 14-year-old girls in anywhere else in the country that are canning green beans. I mean, there's just there's not. So I don't know. For me, it's just there's there's so much of that stuff that that I haven't put in place or that I've kind of stepped away from to well, you make excuses for everything, but to be, you have to put in the work. Like our, the old folks in our family, they put in the work. It was daylight to dark. And we just, we're so busy now. I know for me personally, you're so busy. Like the price of everything is outrageous. You're literally having to work. You know, both parents in the household are having to work full-time jobs just to keep the lights on you're spending all your there's so many extracurricular activities going on with your kids you know it's it's constant you just stay so busy like even if i wanted to grow a garden i don't know that i could because i'm so busy but there's always time to grow green beans just always time. well man's farm grows my green beans lance okay i like, grow a lot of them it's the kaiser farms Growing green beans. If that baby wants to start canning green beans, you better get her some green beans growing at the house so she can can them. Look, if she wants to put the time in in the garden, we'll grow whatever she wants to grow. Except that, Ryan. We can't. We ain't growing that. Uh, she can. can. It's legal. Sure. She can't. She can't. Ah, that sucks. No, what you? I didn't mean to cut you off. <clears throat> No, as you're far good. as green beans go, uh, dude, uh, my wife's grandmother wanted some planted, and I got them in a like one of those, you know, how they use tires as a decoration for flowers and stuff. I got one of those and just put fencing around it, planted it all around that. So now they're just starting to go up the fencing in a circle, and we can just go around and pick it all. Yeah. Like my grandpa garden but both of my grandparents gardened my grandpa who lives in ohio was 85 and still puts out a pretty good and he and he's by himself but still puts out a pretty good size garden and always has um so when i moved into my house here in wise like one of the things i wanted to do was put out a garden um not that i couldn't run to the grocery store five minutes away and get green beans and all the things that I could possibly ever want. Um, but it's just one of the things that I wanted to do. And then when Haley and I got married and she had never really gardened either, we're kind of figuring it out as we went. Um, she never canned anything or anything. But now, you know, we're 
freezing stuff, vacuum sealing stuff, and doing all kinds of gardening. She's now awake and looking at me through the door here, doing all kinds of gardening. Um, and this year, my oldest one, Pip, was out. She planted every green bean we got, but she stuck in the ground. Every squash plant we got, she was the one that stuck in the ground. And so it is, it's, it's one of those things that like, could I, is it easier for me to go pick up the grocery store? Absolutely. But do I feel a little more, not cultural, but do I feel a little more, does it taste better when we throw it on the dinner plate in the end of July? Absolutely. Because we've been out there in the middle of it, kind of working away and hopefully my girls kind of see that same thing and then kind of put that same type of effort into understanding that, you know what, some of those old timers and stuff they were doing it may seem a little crazy, but we only plant we only plant beans on the front side of the moon phase, right? Because you put them on the back side of the moon phase and they ain't gonna grow. And it sound like it means very much, but three years ago I planted my beans on the back side of the moon phase and nothing happened, right? So those little things that we kind of have picked up over the years. It's important, I think, we can try to pass those things on as much as possible. Yeah. Even even saying that, even just talking about growing your beans on the right side of the moon phase. I mean, that's so Appalachian, dude. Like, that needs to be on a T-shirt. And then taking those beans and putting them in the jar every time you get a fog in August, right? And that tells you how many snows you're going to get. Yep. That's it. <laughs> that's it. No, nah, that's what I'm saying, man. It's just, I don't know. I love this place. I love this area. I love the people. Yeah, it has its it has its downsides, of course. It has its cons. But, man, there's so many positives here. And I couldn't imagine, honestly, I couldn't imagine raising a family anywhere else in the world. Because what we're, what we're talking about, you know, and, and what Lance you were talking about earlier, you know, being able to – to be an individual, you know, because around here, if you don't want nobody to bother you, guess what? Nobody's going to bother you. They're not going to go out of their way. I mean, you might have some people trying to come in and check up on you here, but if you if you want to be off by yourself, you're going to be. It's fine. But at the same time, if you want to be a working part of the community and come in, dude, you can do that too. Like, that's what's so good about this place for me personally especially with the state of the world that, that the world is in. You know, I'm constantly listening to these different podcasts and people talking about be prepared for this, get prepared for that, you know, make sure you have all these things in place. You know, here's this, this food that you can put on the shelf for 20 to last 25 years, 25 years shelf life. You know, you've got all this different stuff, like, you know, try to find your community, try to find your tribe, get together and do all, they're just they're talking about Appalachia. Just be like us right now. If a nuke hit and there was some kind of okay, maybe not a nuke. It depends on how close. Depends on how close it was hitting. But <laughs> let's say some kind of crazy disaster happened. Say there's an EMP, you know, whatever. It shuts off everything. Just from me to the mile it takes to get to the end of my road, just along this road. We've got gardens, we've got cows, we've got chickens. And I know that everybody would come together and say, okay, this is what you're good at. You do this. This is what you're good at. You do that. We're going to do this. We're going to split this up. I know that everybody would come together and take care of everybody else. It probably wouldn't even be a conversation that you'd have to have. It probably would just start to happen. Yeah, it would. Real thing. Like people would probably just start doing and just start handing stuff over and bringing over whatever and bringing over eggs. You probably have your young, some young boy or girl down the road that would bring eggs around every day. That was what she would get up and do. She'd go collect them and then she'd bring them to the people. And it would probably just happen. It would not even be like a community Facebook site that would show up. Hey, we need this. It would probably just start happening because that's the kind of people that people in Appalachia are. Yeah, it would just be organic. It would just, exactly like you're saying, it would just happen. And that's what's so, that's what's so great about this place, about this area. You know, we, we don't have to find our tribe. We're already in it. 
we deal every single day with our tribe. You know, we're our neighbors, our friends, our family, our coworkers. Like I've already every situation and scenario that could possibly ever take place. I've already got somebody in my mind that I'm going to right off the bat. If so, if, if this happens, this is the person I'm going to. If that happens, this is the person I'm going to do. That's a good thing to have. And the better thing to have is to know when you go to these people, they're actually going to be willing to help. And not just willing, but, but will help. That's just, I don't know. It's awesome. I could, this has turned into a, a praise Appalachia episode. We finally but, praise gets enough bad reps. It is. I think we were due one. I think we were due yeah. one of those. Example of that too. Uh, Justin, like, and I go back, I teach, right? So during the summer, there's stuff that we do, but like, I'm not day to day like I would be in the fall and the winter and in the spring and stuff. So I have a little more time to garden, um, as do some of my coworkers. We're like, when we get back in it in August, it'll be like the first month to August when people are harvesting stuff. Every day, it'll be five or six different people bringing stuff that they've gotten or something tried a new salsa recipe they're canning and. We're trading jellies and trades, and it's like we never asked each other. It just kind of like happened. Right? We we all just just kind of like, hey, we, we tried this. See, if we, we we thought this this new seasoning on this salsa. We kind of came up with it and saw it on Pinterest and added some stuff to it. Thought it was pretty good. Once you take three or four cans of it home, have the kids eat it, see if you like it, and then it's just it just naturally kind of happens. Um, yeah, I, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen other places. I'm sure that in places that it does, but I don't think it happens with the frequency that it does here in Appalachia. No, I agree. I agree with you. And, you know, I mean, I've never, I've never lived anywhere. Well, I mean, I did as a small child, but nothing that I really remember. This is the only place that I've ever lived, but I don't feel like there could be more of a sense of community anywhere else. Cause just like we're talking about, I mean, all you have to do is hear it from other people constantly talking about, like I said, need to find this, need to set up these communities, need to, it's, it's here. That's what we have. That's the life that we live. Ryan, you've been a couple of different communities, I guess, in, in your days. Is it different here than other places? Oh, gosh, yeah. Um, of course, I, I love the mountains. I do. I love this area, everything like that. I just think uh, there was a mistake when I was born. God meant for me to live near a beach. <laughs> but somehow there was a mix-up. Uh, it was paperwork or something. And then I ended up here. But I love it. I do miss Charleston a lot, but this place, it's always home. No matter where I've been, where I go, this is always home. Yeah. But in in Charleston, was 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 there that kind of sense of community that we're talking about? No. No, I'm then you know, but that's from an outsider perspective, you know, and I was I did, really didn't know anybody. Now I can say we met a couple down there and just hit it off right off the bat. We still talk to them, and and then the guys I worked with, but of course those are all Air Force veterans and Army veterans and all that. And we were just, you know, it was just veterans. So automatically there's a kinship, and they were just a great group of guys. That was a great community where I worked at. See, like I want to, I'm, I'm with you, Ron. I, I would think I was meant to be at the beach as well. I just, but I've like my wife and I talk. We plan on retiring if we ever get to. <laughs> we have two <laughs> girls, means proms and all these things, and you know, other weddings got to pay for. It. Actually, they're never actually never getting married. I'm not, I'm not gonna have that. Um, but there's you know all these other things. If we, if we ever do eventually get to retire, we have talked about. Being a, in for it. <laughs> we're four and two, Ryan. I'm hanging on as long as I can hang on. Well, my That's sport, the greatest my, thing ever right now. So I'm holding on to that for as long as possible. Mine, I know it's going to end. Mine are 14 and 12, and I've never been closer with them than I am now. 
Awesome. That's, that gives me hope. It's, uh, but you're in for it, dude. Because that <laughs> relationship comes at a price because then it's, you know, I talk to my kids like I talk to you guys, but with uh, with that relationship, you know, when you have to step in and be dad, not, hey, joking around dad, it, it gets tense and it, it amplifies it and you'll see. And then the hormones start revving up in the teenage years and one minute they're laughing, one minute they're crying and Cycles start syncing up. Yeah. Oh, they have all the way up the road, all the all their friends too. Yeah. <laughs> and all the time want to have a sleeper. No, nah, we have enough. We have enough. Now that's community right there. Yeah. That is community. That's it. the the whole holler get it over with at once. <laughs> but back to what I was saying, like that we plan on like be able to go there and spend a ton of time there in our retirement years. But I never would ever see us going and like staying there. Like maybe go spend four or five months, but always coming back home. Right? We were in Florida a couple of weeks ago, and it was awesome. I love the heat. I love the humidity. Like I enjoy it. I didn't mind the hustle and bustle of the people. The girls had a great time. We came flying back into Tennessee. No dad saw those mountains again. I was just like. Oh. I'm home. I, I'm home. It just, it just, it was different. Just a different, like flying down, we're all excited and the girls are all excited and all that stuff. But like, even watching the kids, like, we rolled back into Tennessee and you just kind of tell they're just like, it just feels better. <laughs> or just how, like, we just smells different and, you know, it just, it just feels better. You can kind of tell even with the mock, they're kind of that way. So it's, uh, you're right, man. This is just home. It always will be. Yeah. You can breathe. You can breathe. Well, I definitely was not meant to uh, live at the beach. I'm a ginger kid. Ginger kids don't do real good in beach weather. You were okay. actually meant to be born in Seattle or somewhere like that. That was <laughs> yeah, upper, upper Northwest a, Territory. Was. Pacific Northwestern. Or, <laughs> yeah. I do. That's it. Pacific Northwest. That's where I should have been. Yeah. That's where I should be. I'm going, I'm going up to stay with my boy Maverick. Yeah. We're going to go on crazy Bigfoot hunts at the Canadian border. Do you know Idaho is mostly high desert? Yeah, I know. That's, that's crazy, ain't it? Yes. What's that? So who's the hoe? <laughs> Idaho. <laughs> gotcha. Oh. Bazinga. Bazinga. All right, guys. This has been a good one. I've really enjoyed this one. This uh, kind of took a turn more of just a, a conversation about how awesome Appalachia is. But for those of you guys out there listening, you know, nothing that we're talking we're, – we're not just fabricating anything that we're saying. This is this is really how we feel. I mean, this, this place is home. And no matter how many episodes we come out here and talk about – the you know the high strangeness that goes on around here, uh, you know all the weird stuff that happens. You know, no matter what we're talking about on on that end of it, this is a place that no matter how much darkness is there, there's so much light that always overcomes it. So much light, and all you have to do is to turn your head from that darkness and just look the opposite direction and you're going to see light whether it's somebody helping out somebody else uh, somebody bringing a jar of salsa to somebody at work somebody walking into a river to help baptize their their kid their teenager their young adult kid and seeing that uh, seeing somebody pick up something for, for somebody that they dropped in a grocery store or stepping up there when somebody's short a little bit and, and paying for that. Whenever you're seeing somebody pay for somebody's meal in the drive through behind them, you know, these are all little bitty things that happen every single day that we don't pay a whole lot of attention to. But, man, that's so much light. And, yeah, we're in a battle. I talk about it here all the time. 
We're in a spiritual battle every single day. There's junk out there and darkness out there. And they're coming for you. They're coming for me. They're coming for all of us. But the darkness can never overcome the light. Actually, Ryan, there's no such thing as dark, right? Yeah, only in the absence of light. Only the absence of light. So remember that, guys. There's no such thing as darkness. Only the absence of light. And if you're, Which I jump. And if you're from out of the area and you come in and visit, some old timer offers you a dark hood, six or a bush lot and some cornbread, just say no. <laughs> or if you don't care, enjoy. <laughs> yeah. But you'll be eternally damned for all time. That's what eternally means. <laughs> All right, we went on too long. Yeah. Uh, real quick side note, I jumped back into Hellier again today just to get back into it. And going through it the second time, I think it's even crazier. The first season, going through it the second time is even crazier than the first time going through it, I think. Because we've talked about it so much now that all these correlations are like, you know, boom, 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 boom. So. I'm sure I'm going to have a lot of topic ideas coming up from that, too. And, well, this will be a different episode. The cave systems, man. Y'all, the listeners, viewers out there, y'all be ready. Because for the first almost two weeks in the month of July, I'm spinning at the breaks. All right? And the breaks has got caves everywhere. If anybody has listened to the podcast Penny Royal, you'll hear talk about the breaks in that. Um, it's literally a handful of miles from Hellier, Elkhorn, these places. I'm putting some time in there. I'm doing some investigative work there. These boys are going to come out and join me, and we're going to get weird. We're going to get weird. You heard it here first, folks. We're going to get spelunked. <laughs> spelunking hasn't came up here in a long time, dude. Yes. All right, guys. Keep tuning in. Keep coming for the weirdness. Listen to our uh, tirades and sidebar conversations about how awesome Appalachia is. Uh, keep sharing the show. Guys, keep sharing the show. Follow us on all our socials. Subscribe to our YouTube. Uh, we've got a couple really awesome guests, I think, lined up that we should be correlating with in the next few weeks. Um, we're going to keep doing this thing, guys. We're going to keep doing this thing. Even if every single one of you out there decide, you know what, I'm done with this show, we're still going to do this every week. It doesn't yeah. even matter. Like, so, on. yeah, we just love each other that much. We're still going to do this. And we'll, we'll laugh. And I kind of like listening to myself talk. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. I love you, boys. Love you guys. Love you, brothers. Hey, uh, you? guys, don't forget, email us topic ideas. You want to hear us look something up, look into something, talk about it. Or if you got something you want to talk about, want to be on the show, email us, guys. I love nothing more than diving in and trying to figure out stuff and learn everything I can about something. So shoot you, yeah, send us some stuff. Yeah. I promise I won't berate you. It'll be open-minded discussions. At first, at least. At first. Once unless you you're talking about me. Unless you're talking about flat earth, then he's going to berate you. Severely. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what do y'all think about but, calling our – That's a question that every globe believer asks. I heard, yeah. I heard that one more time. I won't get on that. Yeah, right. No, we can't keep going. Justin well, brought it up. Welcome to Flat Earth. Yeah. What an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Love you. Love you, boys. Love you, listeners, viewers, all you people, all you heel folk.
Hey, maybe we can call them heel folk. Hey, shit, son, our heel folk. Is that oh, is that okay. is that got a good ring to it? Let us know. Hey, let us know what y'all <clears throat> think about heel folk. Do you want to be called heel folk? The heel folk. The heel folk. God, I like that. I like it, and that just that just happened. Just, just witness history, folks. Okay, if y'all hate it, let us know that you hate it. If you don't want to be called heel folk, if you got other ideas, let us know. Uh, but until then, if nobody lets me know, y'all gonna be called heel folk. So, until next time, heel folk. See y'all later. We will see y'all later.